Hello, everyone. Jeffrey Gardner here with another episode of The Lost Bots. Now, today's episode is going to be a little different. We don't have any guests. So instead, you're going to get to listen to me uh, flat my gums for the next 10 to 15 minutes talking about one of my favorite things ever, deception technology with slides. So rejoice for all of your dreams have come true. Now, for the two or three of you who may still be listening in, uh, deception technology comes in a variety of different flavors. So I like to call it honey things. Um, why? Because it's fun to say. Uh, but before we get into the actual meat of what honey things are, why, how they work, and some examples, I think we should spend a minute or two talking about a little bit of honey history. So for that, I will share my screen and we can get started. So then and now, um, honey things really gained traction in the late 1980s. Uh, Cliff Stoll from Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory discovered that their network was under attack. So he devised a fake missile defense project named SDINet and created fake documentation to make it seem real. The attacker eventually connected to that system, spent hours looking through the documentation and allowed security personnel to trace that back to the source of the connection. Fast forward to today, the land of the future with flying cars and futuristic looking buildings. Um, and we have a number of different open source solutions that are available, uh, Cowrie, HoneyPress, and a number of different styles of Honey Things. So why Honey Things? Um, low false positive rates. So when they're configured correctly and after appropriate whitelisting, you're not gonna be swimming in alerts that go nowhere. Minimal maintenance and overhead, since these systems, uh, the low interaction style, which I'll detail a little bit more later, really don't utilize a lot of resources and are properly hardened, uh, they're not gonna have a lot of maintenance, pretty much set it and forget it. And then extensible. And by extensible, I mean, you can change or increase the levels of interaction uh, if desired. So honey things generally come in three flavors, uh, systems, services, and tokens. Systems or things would be like a Linux host configured to act as a honeypot. Um, services would be software configured to mimic the authentication process of an SSH server. And tokens would be something like a specially crafted document sitting in a file share, a unique table in a SQL database, or an unused user account and password. And while these honey things are generally defined by what they're designed to mimic, they can be used in conjunction with one another. They're not exclusive. So an example would be a system that hosts services or that stores tokens. Now, what are the important characteristics of these honey things? So discoverability, interactivity, and monitoring. So discoverability just basically means placement. Now, uh, things like research honeypots, like Rapid7's Project Heisenberg, uh, are generally placed outside the network, so on something like a DMZ. While a production honeypot would be in a specific branch of the network uh, with other legitimate hosts. Uh, interactivity just means um, you know, the level that it will respond to, and it generally falls in a spectrum of low to high. So um, high interaction would basically mean like an entire operating system designed to mimic the real thing, but in reality is capturing all the details about attacker tools and techniques. Anything outside of that generally falls under the low or lower end of the interactivity spectrum. Um, and then the piece that connects everything together is monitoring. So for most of these honey things, um, they're going to be configured with verbose logging so you can see what's going on. It's going to be tied to an alert. And then most importantly, that alert is going to be tied to a process which allows you to investigate the interaction further. So the goals of honey things, detection, research, and exhaustion. Detection, exactly what it sounds like, a canary in the coal mine. Uh, when they touch it, it sings and you'll know to go and look at it. Um, research, like we mentioned earlier, it's basically designed to examine the tools and techniques that are being used to exploit the things that you've made available. Um, and then exhaustion basically just means to waste as much of the attacker's time as possible by deploying a large amount of technology um, that appears real and keeps the attacker interested. So, you know, it, all this sounds amazing, uh, but you'd be surprised that there are a number of objections to utilizing deception technology in environments. So, um, too complex, too expensive is a common one. And while that may be true for some of the higher interaction uh, honey things, the majority of things that are out there like honey files, honey credentials, honey users are very low interaction deployed on small servers with limited resources, simple programs, sometimes even scripts. Um, only useful for research. Um, again, true for research systems, but low interaction systems placed in production networks 
are a great high fidelity detection mechanism. Uh, easily identified can be very, very true. But by the point that they've interacted and fingerprinted the honey thing, it really doesn't matter. An alert should have been generated and someone should be investigating that event. And then the last one is these honey things, for example, honey pots can be compromised. Um, can be true. Um, normally this occurs more in the higher interaction um, honey things, just because as you increase interactivity, the attack surface grows and the probability that the system can be compromised also grows. But again, even if it does become compromised, the main goal alerting will have occurred and someone will be, the incident response process will be underway. So now that we've learned about honey things, let's go over some examples of what they actually are. So honeypot, in this case, hosting a honey service. What an attacker would see when they look at this is they'd see a system listening on something like a standard telnet port, RDP 3389. What would they think? The attacker should think this is a legitimate business asset. And this is where the tools, the two schools of thought on deception technology comes into play. So there's one school of thought that says this should blend in, should not be seen. It should look as realistic as possible. The other school of thought, which I belong to, goes, I want to make this thing look like a flamingo in a herd of cows. I want someone to look at this and go, what is this thing? I need to interact with it. Um, just to play on the psychological aspects of you know, the attacker's mindset. Um, either way works, because um, the goal is when the attacker tries to connect, we'll know that they're on the network. So honey users, um, an attacker sees a domain admin account in the local administrators group. Um, this is one that I've used in the past. Um, the attacker should wonder, actually anyone should wonder, but why? Um, so when the attacker attempts to interact with this account and gather more information on it, we'll know that they're on the network. And honey credentials and memory. So uh, an attacker sees a username and password tied to a fake domain admin account when they dump LSAS. The attacker should think these credentials provide elevated access. So naming this one like patch admin, uh, Intune admin, SCCM admin, something along those lines. So it'll make them think, okay, I can compromise this account and gain wide access throughout the environment. And then when the attacker attempts to authenticate with that, we'll know that they're on the network. And I did miss one thing, which are honey files. So a honey file is basically when an attacker sees a file in a place they're likely to browse, it should look like it's contained some, you know, interesting information. So like accounting.db, passwords.txt, uh, do not delete dot, you know, PDF, whatever it may be. And then when the attacker interacts with that file, we'll know that they're on the network. Um, one thing to note with the Honey users that I forgot to mention is if you're going to set up an account like this, one of my recommendations would be, especially if it's a domain, domain admin, make the password something crazy, like 128 character password, then set the log on hours to, to basically be never. And the reason why is we don't want to inadvertently give them a domain admin account that they could actually abuse. Um, so to the end point. Now, I, hopefully, everything that I've, that I've told you about here will give you the impression that honey things don't have to be hard and can represent a very easy win for your overall security program. Um, I hope that it's piqued your curiosity about some of these things and that you'll go out and research and experiment with, you know, some of the various things that I've, we talked about today, for example, honey files, honey users, um, they're very easy to create. Um, the only real limit with a lot of this technology is going to be your imagination. So placement, naming conventions, interactivity levels, the sky's really the limit. I mean, there's some really cool things that are coming around the pike. Um, honey commands, for example, where you rename the commands on a Linux host. So when an attacker gets on a Linux system and then tries to execute normal administrative commands, it'll actually use a webhook to trigger an alert because the admins of that system should know that the rename commands are the real commands and that the normal admin commands are not. Um, all kinds of cool stuff. But please, um, you know, if you've enjoyed this episode, hit the like or subscribe button to let, let us know that you're enjoying it. And I sincerely wish that you're all having an amazing day and that I will see you next time.